If you're a Muslim, I want to ask you a question. Has there ever been a time in your life where you wanted something to happen so bad but it just didn't happen? Well, the next time you feel like this, remember this description of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge. Allah ya'lamu ma kana wa ma yakun wa ma lam yakun idha kana kayfa yakun. Oh, 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 Laith, slow down. What did you just say? Ya'lamu ma kana wa ma yakun wa ma lam yakun idha kana kayfa yakun. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what happened in the past. He knows what is happening right now. He knows what is going to happen in the future. He knows what will not happen is not going to happen. But if it were to happen, how it would have happened. So remember, Allah knows everything. All you have to do is stay on the right path. In Surah Al-Baqarah, Ayah 216, Asa an takrahu shay'an wa huwa khayrun lakum. Wa asa an tuhibbu shay'an wa huwa sharrun lakum. Wallahu ya'lamu wa antum la ta'lamun. It could be that you dislike something that's good for you or you like something that's bad for you. Allah knows and you do not know. Here's the du'as for eating that you should know. Of course, you should eat with your right hand and say Bismillah when you start eating. If you forget to say Bismillah in the beginning, then when you remember, say Bismillahi fi awalihi wa akhirih. Believe it or not, there's even a du'a upon drinking milk. You say Allahumma barik lana fihi wa zidna minh. When you finish eating, you say Alhamdulillahi alladhi at'amani hadha wa razaqani min ghayri hawlin minni wa la quwa. Now, if someone offers you a meal or offers you a drink, you say Allahumma at'im man at'amani and finally, if someone invites you over, you say, Allahumma barik lahum, fima razaqtahum, waghfir lahum, warhamhum. Make sure to screenshot and memorize them all. This is the one you say when you forget to say Bismillah. This is the one you say upon drinking milk. You say this after you finish eating. This is the dua when someone offers you a meal or a drink. And finally, this is the one when you're dining at someone's house. Make sure to screenshot all of them, memorize all of them, and share this for good deeds. Here are the du'as that you should know on the days that you fast. After you break your fast, say, ذَهَبَ الظَّمَأْ وَابْتَلَّتِ الْعُرُوقِ وَثَبَتَ الْأَجْرُ إِنْ شَاءَ الله. The thirst is gone, the veins are moistened, and the reward is certain if Allah wills. Now, if someone serves the iftar to you and serves food to you and you break your fast with it, say this, أَفْطَرَ عِنْدَكُمُ الصَّائِمُونَ وَأَكَلَ طَعَامُكُمُ الْأَبْرَارِ وَصَلَّتْ عَلَيْكُمُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ May the fasting break their fast with you and the pious eat your food and the angels pray for blessing on you. Now on the night of Laylatul Qadr, you should say this dua, Allahumma innaka afuun kareem tuhibbu al-afwa fa'afu anni. Oh Allah, indeed you are pardoning. You love pardon, so pardon me. Make sure to screenshot all of them. Here's the first one. Here's the second one. And here is the third one. Make sure to memorize and share this for good deeds. If you're a Muslim, I want to ask you a question. How often do you send prayers and peace upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Ubayy ibn Ka'b radiallahu anhu once asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rasulullah, what happens if I dedicate my entire dua towards sending prayers and peace upon you? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam responded, If you do that, then tukfa hammak wa yughfaru dhambuk. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take care of all of your concerns and He will forgive all of your sins. One day the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had joy on his face. The people asked him, why are you so happy today, Ya Rasulullah? He said, Jibreel alayhi salam just came to me and he said, doesn't it make you happy that there is no one that sends peace and blessings upon you except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends 10 times that peace and blessings back upon them? When you send peace and blessings upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, guys, Allah raises you 10 darajat and forgives 10 of your sins. When you send salawat, Jibreel actually responds to you alayhi salam. When you send salawat, an angel takes it to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he responds to you by name. If you're a Muslim, I want to ask you a question. As a Muslim who lives in a Western country like me, have you ever been in a situation where you're fasting but everyone around you is eating? Well, what if I told you that those were some of the most blessed moments of your life and you probably had no idea? The Prophet wasallam said that if a person is fasting around people who are eating, then the angels will pray upon that person until those people are full. And this doesn't only apply when you're around non-Muslims, it even applies when you're around Muslims and you're doing a voluntary fast. And Aisha radiallahu anha, the mother of the believers, even told us that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fasted the most outside of Ramadan in the month of Shaban, the month we're in right now. So the next time you're in this situation, just remember that the angels are asking Allah to forgive you and are praying for you. Another situation where the angels pray for you is when you eat your suhoor, which is the meal you have before Fajr and starting your your fast. You're eating suhoor, the angels are sending blessings upon you, so the Prophet ﷺ told us don't abandon the suhoor, even if it's just a sip of water. Ya Layth, where did the crescent moon and star symbol come from? And why does it symbolize Islam? Sometimes people think that it actually does symbolize Islam because a lot of the Muslim countries today have it on their flag. And in many Muslim societies today, they're on top of minarets and domes and tombs. But the reality of the situation is that the crescent is not the defining symbol for Islam whatsoever. 
Crescent Moon and Star only started being associated with Islam in the 15th century after the Ottoman conquest of Constantinople. Constantinople is Istanbul today. The symbol for Constantinople was the crescent star and moon. And the reason for that is because it has Marian associations. You see, the Hagia Sophia, which was a church, was actually dedicated to the Virgin Mary. And in Christian symbols and iconography, the Virgin Mary is represented by the crescent because Christians believe that she is queen of heaven. She also wore blue and was surrounded by stars. So after the Ottomans took Constantinople and it became their capital, they made it the symbol on their flag. It became the emblem of their state and by extension, the emblem of Islam. So when these countries became independent, they just kept the symbol. And that's where the crescent actually came from. Make sure to share. If you're a Muslim, I want to ask you a question. Do you want to die as a Muslim? Well, what if I told you that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us that whoever says this before they go to sleep and then dies, dies as a Muslim. And if they don't die, they wake up and get its reward. This is an easy reward, inshallah. Get ready to memorize. Allahumma aslamtu nafsi ilayk wa wajjahtu wajhi ilayk wa aljahtu dhahri ilayk wa fawwattu amri ilayk raghbatan wa rahbatan ilayk لا ملجأ ولا منجا منك إلا إليك آمنت بكتابك الذي أنزلت وبنبيك الذي أرسلت Guys, you need to memorize this as soon as possible. Look, I'll move it up for you here just so you screenshot it and memorize it. So again, make sure to screenshot it, memorize it, and share this for good deeds. <laughs> Yeah, the audio just ended. I don't know why this guy made it only 53 seconds long. Anyways, go screenshot and memorize the du'as and give me some ajr. If you're a Muslim, I want to ask you a question. Do you know the story of Salman al-Farisi radiyallahu anhu? Salman al-Farisi was the son of a Zoroastrian priest in Persia. He would see a Christian monk worshipping sometimes. And after meeting him, he actually became a Christian. So his father locked him up in chains and killed that monk. But before he died, the monk told him to go to Syria to find pure Christians like him because there weren't that many left. So Salman escaped there and he became a disciple of those priests. So long story short, after those priests died, the last priest told him that all of those Christians have died. But the time of the chosen one is coming, so you should go find him. His priest told him that he will be in the land of the dates and he will have a mark on his back and he won't accept charity, he will only accept gifts. Since Salman had no prestige, he was actually sold off as a slave in Medina. And he spent decades looking for this promised one. Then the Prophet ﷺ came to Medina. The man offered him dates as a charity, but the Prophet didn't eat any. The next day he offered him dates as a gift and he ate some. And when he saw the mark on the Prophet's back, he started crying and kissing his hands and kissing his feet. Remember, whoever is sincere will be guided. If you're a Muslim, I want to ask you a question. Why do we fast? What are the benefits of fasting? Well, Allah Azza wa Jal tells us why we fast in Surah Al-Baqarah. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, kutiba alaykum as-siyamu kama kutiba ala ladheena min qablikum la'allakum tattaqoon. So the reason Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us to fast is la'allakum tattaqoon. The word la'allakum means several things. It can mean so that you, or so hopefully you, or so perhaps you, tattaqoon. So that you become conscious, so that you become aware, so that you protect yourself. Protect yourself from landing in future trouble, from disappointing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, from disappointing the messenger, for disappointing yourself. Fasting is a mental and physical struggle. Your body tells you let's eat and drink, but your heart says no, not until Maghrib. And your heart's supposed to do the same when you see something you're not supposed to be looking at. But in Ramadan, for example, shaitan is locked up, so you have 30 days to make your heart stronger and your urges weaker. And if you fast outside of Ramadan, it becomes even stronger. The Prophet used to fast a lot in this month's Shaban, so go fast. If you're a Muslim, I want to ask you a question. Do you want nothing to harm you? Well, what if I told you that the Prophet ﷺ told us that there is nobody that says three times in the morning and three times in the evening, Bismillahi ladhi la yadurru ma'ismihi shay'an fil ardi wa la fis samai wa huwa sami'u al-alim that anything harms them. So just say this three times in the morning and three times in the evening and you won't be harmed. What's easier than this? Come on, quickly, memorize it. I'll even move it up for you so you screenshot it right now. Make sure to memorize it and share this for good deeds.
If you're a Muslim, I want to ask you a question. What kind of person are you when you pray? You see, the scholar Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah said that there are five levels of people in Salah. The first level is someone who doesn't do their wudu properly, doesn't fill the mandatory pillars of Salah, and is negligent and is careless in his Salah. This person is actually punishable on the Day of Judgment. Second level is someone who has done the wudu properly and observed the mandatory pillars of the Salah, but he lets the shaitan mess with his head and throughout the whole Salah, he's thinking about what the shaitan wants him to think about and the shaitan steals his prayer from him. This person is actually held accountable on the Day of Judgment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses to accept or just punish that person. The third level does the proper wudu and observes the pillars, but throughout the Salah, he's fighting the shaitan and he's fighting his nafs. He struggles with these thoughts so the shaitan doesn't steal his prayer and this person gets the reward for jihad and salah. Fourth level has the requirements done and wants to perfect everything. Their heart is totally immersed in the salah and they're rewarded for it. Fifth is in complete submission as if he sees Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Forgets everything around him and prayer is a source of joy and this person is close to Allah. If you're a Muslim, I want to ask you a question. Are you praying your 12 sunnah rak'ahs? Do you even know the reward for the 12 sunnah rak'ahs? Before I tell you that the sunnah prayers are as follows. Two rak'ahs before Fajr, four rak'ahs before Duhr, two or four rak'ahs after Duhr, two rak'ahs after Maghrib, and two rak'ahs after Isha. The Prophet ﷺ told us that the two rak'ahs before your fourth Fajr prayer are worth this dunya and what is in it. The Prophet ﷺ also told us that whoever prays four rak'ahs before Duhr and four rak'ahs after Duhr, they will be saved from the hellfire. And the Prophet ﷺ told us that whoever prays those 12 rak'ahs regularly, they will have a house built for them in Jannah. Not only that, on the Day of Judgment, if your fart prayers were incomplete, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will command to see if you have offered any voluntary prayers to make up for them. And only by His mercy you can go to Jannah. So to get all of these amazing rewards, simply start praying your sunnah prayers on a regular basis. If you're a Muslim, I want to ask you a question. Do you know how to pray? You're going to say, Laith, of course I know how to pray. But no, I mean, do you know how to pray properly so your prayer is accepted? Scholars have agreed that there are 14 different pillars for Salah that I'm about to tell you right now. Because on the Day of Judgment, the first thing that we will be questioned on will be our prayer. So what are the mandatory pillars of Salah? Number one is your intention. Don't start praying then halfway through you realize you're praying Maghrib. Number two is Takbiratul Ihram, which is the first Allahu Akbar to actually start your prayer. It's called Takbiratul Ihram because it makes what's permissible Haram. Because after you say it, you can't eat, you can't drink, you can't look around, you can't talk. Number three is Qiyam, standing up straight. If you pray sitting down but you're able to stand, your prayer is not valid. Number four is reciting Surah Al-Fatiha. Number five is Rukur or bowing. Six is rising from bowing. Seven is Sujood. Eight is sitting between the Sujood. Nine is sitting in Tashahud and ten is reciting Tashahud. Eleven is Salatul Ibrahimiyyah. Twelve is Taslim. Thirteen is that you have to be calm. If you're not calm, your prayer is not accepted. And fourteen, do them in order. What do you know about your Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? What do you know about his good manners? Anas ibn Malik radiyallahu anhu said that the Prophet never told him uff, never told him why did you do this or why didn't you do this? What do you know about his humbleness? Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam rode donkeys even if he had a camel. He used to sleep on a rough surface that made Umar radiyallahu anhu cry. Abdul Rahman ibn Auf radiyallahu anhu told us that he never saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam eat wheat bread to his full. What do you know about his bravery? One day there was a loud noise in the middle of the night in Medina. Everyone went out scared and they saw that the Prophet ﷺ already took a horse without a saddle with a sword around his neck telling people everything is fine. Ali radiallahu told us when the fighting got severe they seek refuge with the Prophet ﷺ. What do you know about his generosity? When he was gifted a brand new shirt and someone asked him for it, he just gave it to them. And what do you know about his love for his ummah? He used to cry for his ummah, me and you. And he saved his dua so we get forgiven on the Day of Judgment. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. If you're a Muslim, I want to ask you a question. Are you a hypocrite? Or do you think that someone is a hypocrite? Well, the Prophet ﷺ told us that the signs of a hypocrite are three. Number one, whenever he speaks, he tells a lie. Number two, whenever he makes a promise, he always breaks it. And number three, if you trust him with something, he proves to be dishonest. So for example, if someone lets you borrow something, you don't give it back. Now ask yourself, do you have any of these three qualities? Well, if you do, it's never too late to make tawbah and change. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from hypocrites and protect us from being hypocrites. If you're a Muslim, I want to ask you a question. 
Do you struggle when you're reading the Qur'an? You look around you and you see people who have been reciting the Qur'an since they were kids with perfect tajweed. You think to yourself, oh my God, I can never be like that. Well, I have some good news for you. What if I told you that the Prophet Sallallahu said this, Al-Mahiru Bil-Qur'an Ma'as-Safaratil Kiramul Barara That the one who recites the Qur'an with no issue really and is really proficient at it is with the righteous and noble scribes or angels. But the Prophet Sallallahu also tells us that the ones who recite the Qur'an wa huwa the one who stumbles over and is struggling will have two times the reward of the one who is with the righteous and noble scribes of angels. This shows us that the struggle itself is worship. And the greatest barrier to this worship is our arrogance, that we don't want to fail. But our sincere struggle and trouble with reading the Quran is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves to hear. So let's go read the Quran and try to perfect it. If you're a Muslim, I want to ask you a question. Do you know what you should say when you put on your clothing? If you don't, don't worry, I got you. I'm about to tell you right now. First of all, when you're putting on your clothing, you should start with your right side and say, Alhamdulillah, الذي كساني هذا الثوب ورزقني من غير حول مني ولا قوة. All praises for Allah who has clothed me with this garment and provided it for me with no power or might from myself. Now listen to this. The Prophet وسلم, told us that whoever says this dua when putting on their clothes, they will be forgiven for their former sins and their later sins. Also, when the Prophet وسلم, himself put on a piece of clothing, he would say this dua. اللهم لك الحمد أنت كسوتني أسألك من خيره وخير ما صنع له وأعوذ بك you can screenshot the first one right here. And here's the second one. Memorize and apply and share this for good deeds. Ya Laif, can you backbite non-Muslims? We all know that backbiting a Muslim, talking bad behind their back is a major sin in Islam. Backbiting could punish someone in their grave. Backbiting can make you bankrupt on the day of judgment. Backbiting can have you in Jahannam scratching your face and your chest with copper nails. But what about when it comes to non-Muslims? Can you backbite them? In Islam, it is haram to transgress. It's haram to oppress non-Muslims. You shouldn't have vulgar words on your tongue. If what you're saying about someone is true, then you are slandering them. And if you are making fun of someone physical appearance, you're making fun of Allah Azza wa Jal's creation. Oh look at them, they're kind of fat, they're kind of skinny, they're kind of ugly, they're kind of this, they're kind of that. Are you making fun of something Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made? This is haram. Muslim or non-Muslim, this is wrong. This is not how Muslims speak. Your tongue should remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It shouldn't talk bad about others, only cowards do that. So repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, start a new page in your life and don't backbite anyone whether Muslim or non-Muslim. If you're a Muslim, I want to ask you a question. Do you want to be rewarded for simply going up the stairs or going down the stairs or going up the elevator or going down the elevator? Well, all you have to do is follow the sunnah of the Prophet It is authentically narrated that when the Prophet went up to a place, he would say Allahu Akbar. And when he would go down to a place, he would say SubhanAllah. So whenever you go up, always say Allahu Akbar. And whenever you go down, always say SubhanAllah. What's an easier reward than this? Make sure to share this for good deeds. If you're a Muslim, I want to ask you a question. Do you know how to enter and leave the masjid? You see, when you enter the masjid, you should enter with your right foot. And as you're entering the masjid, say, Bismillah. Allahumma salli wa sallim ala Muhammad. Allahumma ftah li abwaab rahmatik. So when entering the masjid, it's four steps. Step with your right foot, say Bismillah. Send your salutations to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and say Allahumma ftah li abwaab rahmatik. When entering the masjid, you can also say A'udhu Billahi Al-Azim wa biwajhihi Al-Kareem wa Sultanihi Al-Qadim min Al-Shaytan Al-Rajim. If you say this when you enter the masjid, the shaytan himself will say, I will not harm this person for the whole day. When you exit the masjid, you should exit with your left foot, say Bismillah, send your salutations to the Prophet Allahumma Salli wa Sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad and then say Allahumma inni as'aluka min fadlik. So screenshot the first dua here, the second dua, and this is the dua when you're leaving the masjid. Make sure to memorize and apply all of them and share this for good deeds. If you're a Muslim, I want to ask you a question. Do you know the dua that you should say before you go to the masjid? If you don't, don't worry, I got you. I'm about to tell you right now. Allahumma j'al fi qalbi noora, waj'al fi lisani noora, waj'al fi sam'i noora, waj'al fi basari noora, waj'al khalfi noora, wa amami noora, واجعل من فوق نورا ومن تحت نورا اللهم واعظم لي نورا O oh Allah, place light in my heart and on my tongue and in my ears and in my sight and behind me and in front of me and above me and under me O oh Allah, give me abundant light What a beautiful dua Make sure to memorize it, screenshot it right here and share this for good deeds
If you're a Muslim, I want to ask you a question. You know how the holy city of Jerusalem became Muslim. You see, the leader of the Romans, Heraclius, said, I won't give up the city unless your leader himself comes and takes the keys. Now, I already posted the amazing story of how Umar ibn Khattab went from Medina to Jerusalem. Go check it out. After Umar anhu came holding the camel and all muddy, the people were in awe of how humble he was. And the first thing Umar anhu did was clean up Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, which the Christians have made a dump to disgrace the Jews who were kicked out of Jerusalem. And when it came time for prayer, they begged Bilal Allah and who was also there to do the Adhan. Now Bilal Allah who didn't do the Adhan since the Prophet ﷺ passed away because he would always cry, but he did it and the Sahaba started weeping. Then a Christian man named Safranius came to Umar and said, let me give you a tour of the city. So he took him to the church of the Holy Sepulchre and the Adhan for Asr came. The Christian man told him, just pray in here. Umar said, no, if I pray here, the Muslims will make your church a masjid. So he prayed outside and that became Masjid Umar. He respected them and he even brought back 70 Jewish families to Jerusalem. If you're a Muslim, I want to ask you a question. Do you want all of your sins to be forgiven? Well, it is narrated by Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu that whoever says three times Astaghfirullah alladhi la ilaha illa huwa al-hayyu al-qayyum wa atubu ilayh all of their sins will be forgiven even if they were as much as the foam of the sea. Guys, I don't see why you can't memorize this. Say, Astaghfirullah alladhi la ilaha illa huwa al-hayyu al-qayyum wa atubu ilayh three times every single day of your life. Screenshot it right here and share this for good deeds. If you're a Muslim, I want to ask you a question. Do you judge people? You see, judging people is extremely dangerous because when you are judging someone, even in your mind, you're unconsciously putting yourself above that person. You're making yourself bigger than that person and that's what the word takabbur means. And you are consciously or unconsciously praising yourself. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, فَلَا تُزَكُّ أَنفُسَكُمْ هُوَ أَعْلَمُ بِمَنِ اتَّقَى Never praise yourself in piety. Only Allah knows who is truly pious. So it's super dangerous to judge people based off of their niyyah, their intention, their piety. How do you know? Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the King of Kings knows. One day a Sahabi was fighting on the battlefield and his enemy fell to the ground and lost his weapon. And he said, أَشْهَدُ أَنَّ لَا إِلَهِ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَأَشْهَدُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا رَسُولُ الله. But the Muslim still killed him. When the Prophet ﷺ found out, he got super upset. The Muslim man said he said it out of fear. The Prophet ﷺ replied, Did you open his heart and look inside? How do you know his intention? If you're a Muslim, I want to ask you a question. Do you know how the holy city of Jerusalem became Muslim? It was the year 637 and the Muslims had surrounded the city. And the leader of the Romans said, I don't want any bloodshed. But I won't give you the keys to the city unless your caliph himself comes and takes them. So that caliph was Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. So Umar radiallahu anhu went from Medina to Jerusalem and it was only him and his servant and one camel. Umar radiallahu anhu said, let's make a deal. I'll ride the camel for the first half and you ride the camel for the second half of the trip. So they don't get too tired. And Umar radiallahu anhu only had one set of clothing and on the way he actually fell into mud. And when they got to the city of Jerusalem, it was the servant who was on the camel. And Umar radiallahu anhu was holding the camel. Imagine this is the most powerful person on earth at this point who just conquered Jerusalem, all dirty and muddy and holding a camel on the way. And the Romans prepared a lavish ceremony with a long carpet for him. So when he got there, one of the companions said, what is this? Umar radiallahu anhu answered, we are a people who Allah dignified with Islam. We don't need people's validation. If you're a Muslim, I want to ask you a question. Do you know the afkar that you should say after every fard salah? As soon as you finish the salah, say astaghfirullah three times. Then say Allahumma anta salam wa minka salam tabarakta ya al jalali wal ikram. Then you say la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah. Lahu al mulku lahu al hamd wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir. Allahumma la mani alima aatayt wa la mu'ati alima manat wa la yanfa'u dha al jaddi minka al jadd. Then you say, لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له له الملك له الحمد وهو على كل شيء قدير لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله لا إله إلا الله ولا نعبد إلا إياه له النعمة وله الفضل وله الثناء الحسن لا إله إلا الله مخلصين له الدين ولو كره الكافرون Number four, اللهم أعني على ذكرك وشكرك وحسن عبادتك You can also say number five, اللهم إني أعوذ بك من البخل and so on then say Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, and Allahu Akbar 33 times and say La ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah, lahu al-mulku lahu al-hamdu wa ala kulli shayin qadir one time. Then read Ayat al-Kursi, then read Surah Al-Ikhlas, Surah Al-Falq, Surah Al-Nas, and say this after Fajr al-Maghrib, and the screenshot and memorize. If you're a Muslim, I want to ask you a question. Do you understand the importance of having a good intention? Your intention can take you to Jannah and it can take you to Jahannam. The Prophet ﷺ was shown three people who will be amongst the first to enter paradise. Number one, a martyr, so someone who died for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number two, one who refrains from begging for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
The third was a servant who worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the best manner and was sincere to his master. But the Prophet sallallahu also told us of three people who will be amongst the first to enter Jahannam. Number one, a religious scholar and a Quran reciter will be taken to hell because he used to teach people so people call him learned and so people call him a good reciter. Number two, a donator of wealth will only donate it so people call him generous. And number three, a martyr, someone who died so people call him brave, not for the sake of Allah. So let's purify our intentions. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from the people of Jannah. If you're a Muslim, I want to ask you a question. Do you know what you should say after you hear the Adhan? If you don't, don't worry, I got you. First of all, when you're actually hearing the Adhan, you should listen to it calmly and repeat after it. But when the Mu'addin gets to the point of Hayya ala salah, you say La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. And after the Adhan is over, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa taught us a dua. And he himself sallallahu alayhi wa told us that whoever recites this dua after the Adhan, then he will deserve the intercession of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa on the Day of Judgment. Allahumma rabba hadihi da'wati tamma وَالصَّلَاةِ الْقَائِمَةِ آتِي مُحَمَّدًا الْوَسِيلَةَ وَالْفَضِيلَةِ وَابْعَثْهُ مَقَامًا مَحْمُودًا الَّذِي وَعَدْتَهِ إِنَّكَ لَا تُخْلِفُ الْمِيعَادِ You can screenshot the dua right here. Make sure to memorize it and share this for good deeds. If you're a Muslim, I want to ask you an extremely important question. Do you want all of your sins to be forgiven? Well, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us that whoever says Subhanallah wa bihamdihi 100 times in a day, all of their sins will be forgiven even if they were as much as the foam of the sea. Allahu Akbar guys, I don't see why we can't all implement this. If you want, say 20 after each salah to get the habit going. So let's all say Subhanallah wa bihamdihi 100 times in a day and share this for good deeds.